All right. Um, thanks, Sharon. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, I hope uh, you. I won't keep you between uh, morning and lunch, so I will try to keep this. Uh, my plan is to talk for maybe uh, 35, 40 minutes, uh, and then I'll open it up um, and make it interactive to see uh, how people are feeling and if you have any questions. Yeah. Uh, can you guys see my screen clearly? Yeah, we can see that. Okay, yeah. gr great. Uh, so as Sharon mentioned, uh, I have been involved with the Nature Society of Singapore uh, for several years. Um, prior to joining uh, the position uh, as a chairperson, I actually used to be, uh, as well started off as a volunteer, became uh, full-time staff for a while. Um, took several positions, um, I did my PhD, and then uh, since 2016, I've actually been working with uh, BirdLife International, which is a global conservation NGO focusing on birds. Uh, so I divide my time uh, working on bird conservation as well as doing butterfly conservation. Yeah, on my screen, you can probably see my email. Uh, so if any of you have... Uh, questions or just want to reach out uh, that is my email anish triple zero one at gmail.com yeah so let me move on yeah, so a quick introduction about nature society of singapore um, it is the oldest uh, conservation ngo in the country of singapore uh, now 66 years old and it traces back its uh, origins to the Malaysian Nature Society when Singapore and Malaysia were, uh, were one country. Yeah. So the society has a long history um, and uh, in, during these times it's uh, uh, done a lot of uh, advocacy, uh, data collection, uh, education building, awareness raising, etc, etc. And it's structured across different interest groups uh, within the society such as the bird group, butterfly group, uh, etc. Uh, and I've largely been involved in the butterfly group uh, over the years. Yeah. Um, and uh, so if any of you would like to visit the website, it's, uh, let me go back, it's www.nss.org.sg. And you will find uh, places like these, which are the butterfly insect group page um, and this is just a shout out that uh, uh, over the years uh, we've developed paper materials, but also uh, field uh, digital field guides. Right. So on the right side of my screen, you see an app called the Butterflies of Singapore. Um, it is a free app that is uh, quite useful in this part of the world. Um, so feel free to go ahead and download it. Uh, the challenge is that it is still only available for uh, iOS or iPhones. So if you are a user, it should work quite smoothly. Yeah. So moving on, um, while I've described Nature Society of Singapore, uh, many of you may also be familiar with uh, other stakeholders and interested uh, parties in Singapore, uh, which include the National Parks Board, uh, which is the government. Um, as well as Butterfly Circle. Uh, many of you may have known uh, Mr. Q Sin Kun, uh, who has done some amazing work on butterflies. Uh, and in fact, he was the one who connected me with Sharon uh, recently. Uh, also, there is a Wildlife Reserve Singapore, which uh, has the zoo and other uh, parks in Singapore, and they are also doing butterfly work. Uh, so on Butterfly Circle, many of you would be familiar with resources like these, uh, which are the Butterfly Circle's checklist, uh, their blog, which is very heavily visited. It's probably the most visited blog in the country um, for nature issues. And uh, two very good books, uh, Field Guide to Butterflies of Singapore and uh, Caterpillars of uh, Singapore's Butterflies. Um, 
yeah if you do get a chance i'd recommend any any and all of these resources it's, uh, they are they have excellent photos and excellent natural history accounts as well so uh, i work very closely with q uh, and uh, many others on uh, on butterfly conservation issues and therefore uh, while we were many of us were working in our silos in the past uh, in the coming years we have merged and uh, and have been working together on many issues which is which is good for for butterfly conservation yeah now assuming uh, many of you uh, may not know about singapore as a country um, i wanted to give a short introduction about the natural history uh, of of the country as it is relevant for butterflies and then dive proper into a little more about how many species are here and uh, what kinds of interesting uh, patterns are we seeing here So uh, on the left side of my screen, you would see a map of Southeast Asia. Uh, in Singapore is a small red dot uh, below the uh, Malay Peninsula and nestled in between Sumatra, Borneo and the Riau Islands. Uh, it's only 700 over square kilometers in size. And uh, in, so in that sense, it's a city, uh, city country or, sit, or a city state. Um, just one degree north of the equator and therefore it enjoys a highly tropical climate now it rains a lot here um, and we have a very very short dry season uh, typically lasting only two three weeks yeah. and uh, despite it being short it actually drives a little bit of seasonality uh, as far as insects go um, so we see at the wet times of the year, butterfly activity reduces, um, which is typically November, December. And then as the new year comes, um, late January, February tend to be drier months, um, during which time uh, we see more flowering activity right? uh, because a lot of uh, flowers would bloom in response to dry weather. And then uh, a couple of months later, we see a boom in insect activity um, so April may tend to be the best months for butterfly watching in the country but that said uh, we see butterflies all through the year uh, where where exactly well uh, uh, if we go back 200 years as you see on the map uh, Singapore used to be uh, this this lush rainforest uh, that this lush country, which was full of rainforest, swamp forest, and mangroves. Okay. Um, this was, uh, 1819 is significant because this was a time when Sir Stamford Raffles uh, from the UK landed in Singapore. And, uh, and that, in a way, started uh, the colonial rule in the country. So Singapore has had many, continues to have many natural habitats, such as uh, tropical rainforests, uh, which, are, uh, which still exist. And Singapore is one of the few countries which still has some primary forest left, uh, the forest that has never been cut down and is extremely rich in biodiversity. Uh, we also have swamp forests, mangroves, um, and, and then on the bottom of my screen, you see uh, these three habitats, which are uh, uh, young uh, secondary forests and uh, freshwaters, uh, swamps or marshes. And then finally, uh, a bit more urban landscape, which, uh, which consists of ornamental plant, plants, landscaped, uh, sometimes for butterflies, uh, many times for, uh, for just ornamental purposes. Uh, so since the time uh, Sir Stanford Raffles landed into Singapore, it, the shape of the, and, and the habitats of the country have changed tremendously. Uh, from being all forest to now you see this mosaic uh, of different land use types. 
um, from good forests all the way to managed vegetation and no forest at all. Um, it is uh, Singapore as an island is home to about five and a half million people. So it's uh, quite densely packed. Um, but in all this, we've still managed to uh, secure uh, about 40% of the land uh, for forests, for green areas, which comprise of uh, good forests to young, young secondary forests or parks. Which in a way is an incredible feat for a city state. And as a result, we still have uh, a fair bit of biodiversity left. So, so let's make a guess about how many butterfly species uh, might be found in Singapore. Now I'll pause here. 340. And say that again. I'm getting somewhere around 340. R right. Okay. How did you come to that? Um, did you, read, just, uh, you know, go did you the, did you Google I, it up? <laughs> <laughs> just a guess based on uh, doctor uh, the butterfly circle uh, yeah right right so oh. situated between indonesia and thailand uh, i was expecting it to have uh, you know both uh, the equatorial species and the uh, ones you know found in the tropical jungle like, mm -hmm. uh, okay okay right that is uh, quite right um yeah, and it, so on that, Singapore, as I described, Singapore is small and, and, and tropical. Um, forgot to mention that it's actually very, very flat. So our highest point in the country is only uh, 160 plus meters, uh, which in a global sense is only a small hill. So we don't have any mountain fauna. Uh, and therefore everything in the country is actually lowland species and because we don't have a dr pronounced dry season everything you see is actually wet forms species um, but yeah uh, the number of species uh, I will just get back to uh, to that but it's quite close to what you described to actually understand how many species there are it is uh, important to know um, how, how well has been a fauna been studied and documented. And sometimes we may not realize how important uh, this is, uh, but only becomes Im important when we begin to see one. I hear some disturbance. Can somebody mute themselves? Uh, I guess Ethan Nagraj has unmuted. You can mute him again. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry. All right. Great. Yeah. So, the study of butterflies uh, in Singapore really started from 1834. Can you guys still hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Great. Great. All right. Yeah, so the study of butterflies started since 1834 when uh, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace uh, landed and he uh, was a keen naturalist, so he began to document uh, species. Uh, and during British times was when we lost, uh, we had most habitat change, so the forests were converted to agriculture, uh, other forms of land use, spices, cash crops, etc. And uh, that quickly led to a downfall in species uh, by the end of the 19th century. But the next century, we, we saw quite a vigorous set of uh, experts who began uh, studying the Malay and uh, Singapore butterfly fauna, starting with Cobbett and Pendlebury, who produced uh, four versions, uh, starting from uh, 1956 when we started having a suction on Singapore's butterflies uh, down to Fleming, W.A. Fleming who produced his first edition in 1970 
uh, in the 1970s, and the second was in 1991. Uh, so th those still stand as very important baselines of our work here, um, followed by which uh, we, we started seeing uh, local experts, such as Stephen New, who produced the first field guide. Uh, it was a pocket-sized book uh, uh, launched by the Science Center of Singapore. Uh, called Butterfly of Singapore in 1996. Um, so Stephen New, I must say, must is often called the father of uh, butterflies in Singapore because he started butterfly watching in the 1970s. Uh, he's still around and uh, is a mentor to many of us. Uh, so fast forward, uh, Q. Uh, Mr. Q. Sin Kun was also uh, working and uh, actively documenting species with Stephen New, and together they published uh, a resource in 97. And following that, there were many others, such as our Singapore Red Book in 2008, uh, Field Guides, uh, Q's Books, and then recently we've started documenting things uh, in a bit more um, scientific way. So here's to uh, the earlier question. The well, Singapore is nestled between uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam. Right? Uh, so if you look at our neighboring countries, Peninsula Malaysia has nearly 1,200. Thailand, Vietnam is about 1,100. Philippines got 900. Philippines, interesting, of course, that uh, a lot of that 900 species uh, endemic live on there. So how many species may Singapore have? Uh, well, if you just go by size, uh, Singapore is many hundreds of times smaller than uh, any of its neighboring countries. Right? So by that account, it should have um, less than 100 species. But uh, we know that the species don't follow linear linearity and, and therefore there are rules like species area curves which which define in a given area how many species might be found and uh, as a matter of fact we do have uh, over 300 over 330 species now uh, Q me uh, and a few others produced this this research uh, in early 2018, when we had recorded 334 species as, as extent or still found in Singapore. Yeah. And that number has risen to about 340. Yeah. But let's not forget uh, of this 334, uh, right? Uh, a, a comparable number, 144, are actually extinct. So about uh, a quarter of species in Singapore have gone extinct, um, which is expected in a, in a small country that has gone through so much transformation. However, uh, so uh, Dr. Dasak, question, sorry. Yeah, please. Uh, so of the, what is deemed extinct, um, are these mostly migratory in nature, uh, which are no longer occurring because of uh, land conversion, or is it like uh, mm -hmm. uh, these are high altitude? Right. Um, so most of the species that have gone on the gel. All right. If, if others could mute yourself, that'd be great. Thanks. Yeah. So okay. we, we hear a lot of background. Let me try to mute. Just a second. Okay, great. Yeah. So most okay. The so most of the species that are extinct in Singapore are deep forest species. So they used to be residents, and because of land use change, we lost the the habitat, and they are gone. 
a very small proportion of uh, of our butterfly fauna is actually migratory so of the 334 extant species i should say uh, less than 20 uh, migratory uh, everything else is uh, is present all the year round but the other interesting fact is that uh, since the past 30 years right, since about 1997 uh, where we did this uh, this study uh, we have slowed down we've seen a slowdown in extinctions yeah? uh, because a lot of historic land use change happened and now Sing singapore well whatever needs need, had needed to be developed is more or less developed yeah? so now the nature areas are more or less secured uh, and therefore we, we we've seen a slowdown so only nine possible extinctions uh, in this 30 years but well, what's even more important uh, or interesting is that 65 species have been uh, discovered since 97 so these species uh, were thought to be extinct but because people have been going out there photographing documenting uh, they were rediscovered uh, even more interestingly 51 uh, species uh, are new discoveries. So these are separate from the 65. So 51 new discoveries. And uh, these, some of these are actually uh, species that have, that are non-native, that have landed here with uh, ornamental plants, which happen to come with eggs and uh, butterflies hatched here, uh, made, it, made Singapore its home. Uh, others may have landed uh, unintentionally uh, through other means, such as uh, through vegetable imports, etc., uh, etc. Et we also have uh, several uh, butterfly enclosures uh, who routinely import foreign butterflies, uh, and we've had one or two cases of uh, escapees from there as well. So all of these combined uh, form our new discoveries. Uh, but I want to highlight these because uh, despite the fact that Singapore is relatively well studied as a, uh, in terms of its butterfly fauna, uh, you still see past 30 years so many new discoveries and rediscoveries. Yeah. Which goes on to show um, what about places that are poorly studied, in, in especially in tropical climates. So some examples, um, some of our extinct species include uh, butterflies like the green dragon tail. Uh, we also got uh, other dragon tails. Then we've got uh, uh, other rediscoveries such as the white tip baron and, and others. Right? Um, I mentioned species that were important with plants. So these could be uh, butterflies like the yellow palm dart, right, which is originally Australian and it's been found here since 2010. Yeah. If you look at uh, a spectrum of where these species are found now, you will see that uh, uh, starting from the right hand side, species that were potentially extirpated right, or uh, in the past 30 years, or potentially extinct are largely restricted to forests. Right? So they are deep forest species. And because they're deep forests, they're getting smaller and smaller, or over time, generally drying out due to fragmentation, uh, these species may suffer. But if you look at the other two uh, big, uh, big columns, uh, rediscovered species and newly discovered species, you will see that many of them, in fact, can tolerate degraded habitats, urban habitats, and some of them are very generalist, all habitats. Yeah. And, and this, this seems to be uh, of the phenomena for, uh, for city, city estates and urban areas, where uh, a few species are holding on to the last strongholds of, of mature forests 
and then uh, novel habitats are, are springing up in, and a new community of species are starting to use them. Now, out of, out of the 300 over species that we have in Singapore, uh, they are divided across six families. Uh, and as expected, uh, similar to elsewhere in Asia, most of them uh, are in the three super families, uh, Nymphalidae, Lysnids, and the Hesperids. Uh, and as, as similar to elsewhere, our Lysnid fauna was uh, relatively poorly studied uh, and that group continues to be uh, the most problematic including cryptic species like the aropalas and uh, and others and, and so we continue to make new discoveries now if you look across different uh, locations or habitats you will see that uh, species are also unevenly distributed yeah. so this is from one of my uh, research papers where um, it shows that most of our common species, right, which I indicated in orange, uh, can be found from mature forests all the way to urban parks. Um, so if you have an urban park, you're quite confident that it can attract most of the common species. But the real challenge for conservation comes uh, with your rare species. And as you can see from the green, uh, green section that mature forests support the maximum as expected uh, but the urban parks have a very tiny uh, fraction of rare butterflies so without saying if you want to conserve we, we have to protect our our good habitats now moving on um, while we can protect habitats of course we also have to think about uh, resources and i don't need to explain that uh, uh, as butterfly people we all know um, butterflies uh, well caterpillars are attracted to certain types of host plants and in that some are more specialized than others uh, those that eat only on one genus uh, would be monophagus uh, only on one family oligophagus and uh, polyphagus if it's feeding on multiple families so here's some examples and, and this is relatively well established right? in the practice of uh, even establishing butterfly gardens, habitats. Um, we go through this process of very carefully curating uh, what host plants to plant that can attract uh, the right kind of butterflies. But I want to uh, point to a phenomenon uh, or behavior that uh, we typically don't understand as well yeah. uh, which is flower feeding um, we, we know butterflies uh, adult butterflies are dependent on nectar and uh, and by observation we also know some butterflies uh, are more hungry they keep feeding all the time whereas others uh, especially like your rhodinids are uh, rarely if ever seen on flowers. Yeah. Um, so generally there is a belief that butterflies are pollinators. Uh, uh, and uh, quite rightly, there are some plants such as the snakeweed in the photo, uh, which is exclusively pollinated by butterflies. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, butterflies can be pollinators. But more generally, we must know that uh, butterflies tend to be nectar robbers. Uh, meaning uh, many of them are generalists, feeders, uh, don't have, have, have a preference to a particular flower. Yeah. And uh, using that strategy, they are not really uh, investing in specializing on, on a particular flower. Yeah. So they go in for nectar, any flower that is uh, flowering and take away the nectar uh, without really pollinating and therefore uh, acting as nectar robbers. Yeah. 
Uh, but during the middle months, uh, we see butterfly migration happening between southern coast of Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, and that is the time we see some butterflies show up every year and uh, we classify them as vagrants, migrants, depending on how frequently we see them. Um, uh, but systematically, uh, there has been, uh, we have not been able to uh, tag any species across the two countries to be able to see um, the extent of migration and, and properly document it. That said, it is uh, actually quite small. Uh, yeah. Okay. And can you please name one species which you have seen the migration? This is the uh, last and final question from my sure, side. Sure. Any, any species that you oh. have observed? Sure. So, in, uh, a lot of, it's similar to elsewhere in, in, in Asia, uh, more, most of the denites, right? So we see the, the yellow glassy tiger, for example, which okay. is in my, here, here. Okay, okay. Right, we see para different paranticas, uh, some, sometimes we see other um, tigers as well. Okay, Tirum yeah, yeah. Tirumalas as well. Okay, okay, same like India. Yeah, same. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, several years ago, we also had a mass migration or a mass congregation event of the grass yellows, uh, Urimas, but we don't really know where they came from and it was just for a few days. Yeah. Right, so I'll, move, I'll keep moving. Um, as I was explaining uh, nectar, um, we established that most butterflies are nectar feeders and it is believed that they are generalist, they are, they are feeding on any flowers. Right? So I wanted to challenge that ideology, right? uh, for which I started uh, doing some research on flower feeding. Uh, this was in collaboration with, with Dr. Krishnamik uh, at NCBS in India. Um, so for the field work, we looked at many different sites and across a vertical spectrum from trees to herbs. Right, spending different amounts of time on each uh, plant form. Yeah. Uh, so interestingly, uh, we did a lot of data crunching. Um, and what's more relevant here is that in uh, across different habitats and communities, we could establish that some butterflies are actually nectar or flower generalists, such as the Papilio polytis, common moment. Uh, whereas there are definitely others like the tree yellow on the right side of my screen, which tend to be uh, more specialists. Yeah. Uh, and when we compare native flower use and non-native flower use, right, uh, we found that butterflies are feeding equally on both of these uh, flower types, which was surprising even in forests. Uh, forests tend to have a lot of weeds growing that are non-native uh, and uh, butterflies were really utilizing that. Now, what might that mean for uh, long term? Well, if butterflies spend more time feeding on non-natives, uh, they are spending less time pollinating the native flowers and native plants. So maybe that translates to less reproduction for native plants. Who knows? Something to find out. Yeah. But we also noticed that the flower specialists, yeah, such as the tree yellow, also preferred feeding on native flowers. So quite a nice, uh, perhaps evolutionary link, but uh, good to see. And, and this is important if you are thinking of any restoration projects uh, in a forest landscape or an urban landscape. Um, and if you want to attract your specialist butterflies, many of which are forest species, you want to find, you, you want to do your research on the right kind of nectar resource. Yeah, just planting anything and everything wouldn't work. Uh, I'll keep moving, share a few other snippets and I'll, I'll pause later for questions. Uh, the other piece of research uh, that uh, been involved in is on dispersal and uh, how far do butterflies fly where do they fly uh, when they are in a 
interesting land use uh, remains a mystery, uh, at least in, in Asia. So we started tackling this, uh, for which uh, a lot of butterflies were marked, such as the one shown here. We looked at uh, flight movements and all that. And uh, in summary, we found that uh, the urban matrix, meaning uh, your road sides, your buildings, concrete spaces, as expected, will reduce dispersal. Um, and the other way to think about this is uh, that inside forests, we found uh, butterflies for flying longer distances. Uh, whereas in urban areas, they uh, tended to be more restricted to smaller patches. Uh, and because there were these uh, difficult uh, landscapes, uh, such as buildings to cross, they, they tended to stay in their small uh, patches. So the exchange between patches was reduced and also became more targeted. Meaning if a butterfly wants to cross one habitat location to another, um, it doesn't really go on a random flight path. Uh, when crossing a highway. It is more targeted in a straight line. Yeah. So we are now using a lot of these interesting uh, and useful uh, research to um, start thinking about corridors which Singapore has a lot already. Uh, yeah, but how can we make it a bit more scientific? Um, and here is another one where uh, we, this is a long corridor you know, from the north to south of Singapore. And we did a lot of research, compiled it in a, in a book, which describes uh, the, the corridor's ecology. And it, it's called the Green Rail Corridor because uh, there used to be a railway line, which is now abandoned and uh, the tracks removed, so the land is returned to nature. So this, this corridor has a, um, we did some rapid surveys and found about 79 species, uh, but it, the habitats vary. Um, and, and in these kind of situations, we want to use dispersal studies to understand uh, if we can link natural habitats using these corridors, then um, how would the movements be? Uh, and I must also say in this corridor, we also discovered several important species such as this Malay Yoman, uh, which was a rediscovery for Singapore and some other red list species as well. Uh, the corridor also uh, is home to one of our richest butterfly gardens uh, in an Alexandra hospital, which has over 100 species. Uh, yeah, somebody had a question over. Okay, I'll keep moving. So this is also a crucial corridor for the common bird wing and common rose. Uh, why these two species? Well, uh, for this, I have to give you a little bit of background. Yeah. Um, so in 2015, um, we started on this quest to, uh, to figure out a way to raise awareness about uh, insects and butterfly conservation. Um, to do that, we started this public campaign uh, or a contest to help pick Singapore's national butterfly. Um, so there were six nominees in the race, yeah, as you see on the screen. And what did we want to achieve? Well, conservation is an outcome, uh, but who should qualify, right? So there was some thought gone into uh, this exercise and we thought, well, maybe the species should be beautiful, should be large enough for people to see, they should have national colors, uh, which for Singapore is the red and white, um, maybe it should be common. There's no point having a species that people cannot see and relate to. Um, or maybe it should be, the other line of thought would be, well, the most threatened, which needs more awareness raising or endemic, only found here. So we don't have endemic species, uh, but we have endemic subspecies, such as the parkeri form of, of the night, Butterfly or the Libidia Martha. Yeah. So perhaps that. 
So all of these were considerations, right? And uh, based on that, we we picked up the six nominees. Right? So Painting Jezebel, uh, the Knight, Common Tiger, um, Common Birdwing, Common Rose, and the Tree Nymph. Yeah. And we weaved a story uh, for each one of them. So for Common Rose, interestingly, uh, if you compare uh, the five stars of uh, Singapore's flag and then look back at the common rose, uh, people see some similarity. And right? so you see the five stripes uh, on its hind wing, um, which are also in white. And then you have the marginal red spots, right? which resemble the national color. Now, no surprise, uh, that actually turned out to be uh, the most uh, reason or the favorite reason why people voted for this species. And in 2015, after a period of six weeks of voting, uh, open to the public through online uh, on an online website, uh, Common Rose turned out to be the uh, national winner. I must say that this uh, campaign and, and event was organized by the Nature Society. So it wasn't really a government event. Uh, and to date, the, the National Butterfly is in a way unofficial and we call it a public's vote. But good enough for us to raise awareness. Right. Now, coincidentally, uh, we, we had been making noise for uh, the common rose and the bird wing in Singapore. Uh, uh, many of you uh, by experience would know that uh, these species actually feed on the uh, Aristolochias right, or the Dutchman's pipe as commonly known. Now, uh, the story goes that the native Aristolochia in Singapore is uh, extinct. That was Aristolochia jackii. Um, and uh, the Acuminata uh, is believed to be a non-native uh, which was introduced as an ornamental uh, many decades ago. And, and these two, the rose and the bird wing, have somehow clinged on to, uh, onto this nominative resource. Yeah? So we have written about it, whether it's a race, of, race against time and how we should actually have a more systematic plan to, uh, to plan the, this host plant so the species doesn't go extinct. And we are learning from other initiatives like the Richmond Birdwings uh, Butterfly in Australia, um, which is going through somewhat similar issues and, um, and people are, are bringing it back through gardening efforts. Yeah. Um, so um, just staying on this, um, a lot of research has gone in and we've uh, done a lot of experiments to figure out what are the best conditions for common rose uh, caterpillars to survive, whether it's uh, forest habitats, urban habitats, or, or uh, edge condition, or type of microclimate, uh, etc. So now we're slowly moving towards, uh, or at least nudging the government to develop a, a, a joint action plan for this species. And, and if it doesn't get developed, it would be a joint initiative, I hope with all of the stakeholders uh, I earlier mentioned. Yeah. Now in closing, I would uh, just point out that uh, last year in June, uh, we organized uh, our first swallowtail and birdwing butterfly race. Uh, this was to commemorate the World Swallowtail Day, 9th of June, uh, organized or celebrated by the Swallowtail and Birdwing Butterfly Trust in the UK. Uh, we can't host it again uh, because of coronavirus uh, this year, but uh, we hope to do so in future. Yeah, so with that, I will end. The, these are just some resources. Uh, we have uh, several iNaturalist projects uh, such as this. And if you're interested, you can, uh, this is a great resource to check out some of the joint knowledge and species that we have in Singapore. Yeah. Thank you. I'll open it up for questions. Oh, <coughs> a couple of questions here from here. Um, 
how is the you know species distribution across uh, the natural parks and uh, the zoos, botanical garden like that? Um, do you see that as a degraded forest, or do you see it as an urban park? Right. So maybe I'll, I had a slide to sh we showed uh, this right uh, now. This is the general pattern, right? Uh, the first column is your mature forest, uh, undisturbed, right? And then you have a gradient and degraded fragments, urban parks. Uh, you will see the y-axis is only 210 species because, uh, oops, hang on. Yeah, because uh, you only had good data for that many number of species to do this exercise. But the but the trend is 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 the same for others as well. Hey, officially the spellings are. Yes, yes, Sorry. Official. Sorry, I I didn't hear your question. Uh, Anuj, who was it? Was it Madan or? I think it was Madan. Uh, no, uh, somebody no. else posed a question in between. Uh, okay. Anuj, uh, my question was slightly different. Uh -huh. So, uh, like say, the zoological garden, right? Um, yeah. It was fairly big, had a lot of tree cover. Yeah. Um, in your uh, analysis of the habitat, would mm -hmm. you see that as an urban park or as a... You know, fragmented forest. How how do you? Right. Now that is a complicated question, especially <laughs> if you visited Singapore Botanical Gardens. Uh, wait, did did you mean the the zoo or the botanic gardens? Uh, the botanical gardens, I don't remember, but uh -huh. uh, the bird park and uh, the Singapore Zoo, right? Okay. Uh, okay. Seem to have uh, a, a traces of old growth forest. That's all yes. Right. So it's actually the same for, for the bird park, the zoo, and the uh, botanic gardens. Uh, all of them have uh, natural forests, uh, small fragments, and then they have uh, landscaped areas, right, which are open to visitors. So if, you, if, if I were to classify them, I classify them under two categories, right? Uh, one, the natural part would be the forest fragment and the more urban would be your park. And uh, obviously both of those habitats have quite different types of species. Um, I have a couple of follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, so like say if uh, I as a visitor, right, overseas visitor uh, comes to Singapore, let's like, say, Mm -hmm. um, I see in a, quite a few places the Alexandria Hospital for uh, Trail is mentioned, yeah. one of the best locations. Mm -hmm. uh, so in India, typically, right, a lot of these places require prior permissions and there's a lot of bureaucracy involved. Um, okay. How does it work uh, uh, in Singapore? Um, primarily because many of the species which are considered extremely rare to find, say something like blue lavab, right, mm -hmm. seems to be very relatively very commonly cited in Singapore. Yes, it's quite common actually. Uh, so if I as an overseas visitor, right, um, uh -huh. come there, yeah. um, how easy or like, uh, in, like uh, what are the typical common locations where I need to get prior permission and other places where I can visit on my own without, mm, okay. without violating any of the laws? Right, I, I probably should have had a location map somewhere, um, I can email you one, right? um, off my head, you, most of the places in Singapore are open to public. So you, even our nature reserves, nature trails, you don't need permission. Uh, if you are coming by, a, by yourself or, 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 a, or a small group. Yeah, so you can, uh, botanic gardens, uh, forest trails, Bukit Timah nature reserve, etc. You can just walk in um, and before coming, please let me or any, any of your other Singapore butterfly expert friends know and we can 
suggest you places to go or, or even accompany you. Uh, but you can do it at a very short notice. You don't really need uh, a written permission from or a permit to enter. It's different, of course, if you're collecting research data, right? Uh, then you obviously have to go through a permit process, which is different. Okay, uh, the last question. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so like say, uh, I see a severe degradation of uh, mangrove forest. Yes. Um, and uh, the, you know, and that, that also coincides with uh, you know, bordering countries, you know, where there's a lot of uh, palm oil plantations. Yes. Uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, do you think any, uh, even the lo localized migration, right? Say, mm -hmm. uh, from Sabar close to Sumatra or from Malaysia. Yeah. Um, the absence of a uh, lo lot of this migration is down to that or uh, you know, cr cr crossing these palm oil plantations can be Mm. Kind of challenging, you know, primarily due to the lack of open uh, airways. Because in India, when we see migrations, right, mm -hmm. uh, we see most of the butterflies taking streams um, mm -hmm. and valleys, you know, um, because primarily they are from uh, the high, uh, um, the mid elevation forest and the lower elevation forest of the Western Ghats down mm -hmm. to the plains. Yeah, and uh, they invariably take uh, the route of uh, flowing streams, which flow down stream uh, down the hills. To the plains, or uh, they take the valleys where there is some amount of a uh, tail wind. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So let me try to understand your question. Uh, you you talked about uh, migrating butterflies taking certain routes. Uh, just to address that, um, my understanding why they might stick to valleys is uh, a lot of butterflies prefer higher humidity. Uh, so if you give them an option of staying close to a higher humidity place versus not, uh, preference would be a humid place. Right? So that might be another reason why they, uh, they take valleys and streams. Uh, but coming back to the Singapore-Malaysia context, uh, a lot of mangroves have been lost and we see uh, butterflies like the mangrove tree nymph uh, has uh, become very, very rare in Singapore and it's only found in one small uh, offshore island of Singapore. Uh, uh, mangrove species. Uh, there are others like the dwarf crow, uh, which is also quite rare in Singapore now. So definitely mangrove loss has, uh, uh, has impacts on butterflies. Uh, Migration wise as well, I, I completely agree that it becomes harder for species to migrate through oil palm. So uh, I, I think it would have large implications on migratory species. Uh, it's poorly understood in, in Southeast Asia. Um, but uh, I also know there are some bright people uh, in, in India as well as uh, our friends in Bangladesh were studying migration uh, more broadly. So I, I hope we can understand the impacts of migration and land use change better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Anuj. Before we end the session, I'd, I'd like to go through some of the questions posted okay. by some viewers. Sure. And uh, first question was posted by Ashwit Shetty. He's asking, Mm -hmm. uh, is there any mimic butterflies in Singapore? Any, say that again? Any mimic butterflies in Singapore? Oh, any mimics. Well, yeah. uh, I shared the common rose, right? Uh, yeah. So we have the common Mormon, uh, which the female uh, mimics the common rose, right? Except the, the red body. Uh, so that is one mimic. But there are others. Uh, uh, yeah, we had we used to have the great blue mime, which is now extinct, and that uh, being a papilio mimics the crows. Uh, and there are others as well. Uh, we have several moths that mimic, uh, such as the cyclosia moths. Uh, yeah, the list goes on. Okay. 
the the second from narmada she is from sri lanka mm-hmm. she is asking you what are the host plants of common bird wing found in singapore ah okay well uh, here it was on my slide there is the lokia acuminata i'm just getting to that here yeah. this one on the re- top right of my screen is this the only host plant for uh, common bird wing found in singapore so for all practical purposes yes uh the birdwing also feeds on another astelochiaceae uh, which is a different genus called thotia so we have a native uh, thotia thoti paris i think it's peristemia uh, and which is quite rare as a plant so even though birdwing can utilize it as a plant uh, plant being very rare it ends up using astelochia cuminata yeah okay so the next question was posed by divakar he is asking when can we expect a uh, official announcement on, on singapore's national butterfly oh well this is a pol- slightly political probably never <laughs> uh, yeah Why it is so <laughs> so so to understand this we have to understand why why countries declare symbols and for singapore the only official symbol is our national flower which is yeah. a hybrid orchid right uh, one done yeah. to kim um and and so that has a very strong uh, marketing and national identity uh, so you will see it on different singapore paraphernalia souvenirs etc um so when we did this contest in 2015 for national butterfly uh i actually wrote to the ministries uh including national parks board including the ministry of culture uh etc um so they took a neutral standpoint to say they um, are not supportive uh, they also they don't also object to this practice um uh, so as it stands this is still a public vote uh, and we don't know honestly uh if the government okay. will ever do uh, a revoting okay. to make it official okay 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 thank you mm-hmm. uh so the next question is by harsh jadav is asking what are your thoughts on future of butter- butterfly diversity in singapore hmm i think the, f- the future is n- not bad I, f- i feel we've gone past a point where um the habitats are just going to be degraded so there's a lot of uh, awareness among people and we protect things generally well so most species should stay um but you would know that uh, because of we still have a lot of uh, pesticides and insecticides being used not for crops we we are not an agricultural country but uh, uh actually less more, less pesticides but to control uh, uh dengue and malaria and all that so people use bti btk other other toxic forms uh some of which may be toxic to butterflies um so those may have unintended consequences that uh, we don't know yet and in the long run could be detrimental to species okay so yeah i think we have come to the end of this session and uh, uh, i would like to thank you uh, anuj for you know accepting this uh, and and this is the first ever uh, you know uh, thing where we are organizing uh, talk on you know know about your neighboring butterflies yes. and uh, also a few things such as the butterfly dispersal where the numbered butterflies were all uh, and few couple of those too were all new to me and new to others as well Mm-hmm. and also uh, we we will have uh, an other session on singapore butterflies i mean more about singapore butterflies uh, done by both you and q maybe in the yeah. in the next couple of weeks or so mm-hmm. and uh, before uh, can we sh- uh, can you show me the last slide where you have the t-shirts that has common rows oh okay. <laughs> i will take a picture of it so it's just good yeah hello yeah this is moyu here mm-hmm. hello yeah yeah i have a question that uh, is there is there any other resources of the asteroid 
ऑफ सिंगापुर अदर देन द बटरफ्लाई सर्कल वेबसाइट आइडेंटिफिकेशन एज वेल एंड द डाइवर्सिटी ऑफ स्पिरिट ऑफ सिंगापुर so butterfly circle website and and q's book are the best resource uh, but if you want to go into a bit more detail we end up using corbett and pendlebury uh, fourth version uh, 1992 edition okay thank you very much mm-hmm. and and i know uh, i would like to also uh, put up a point uh, saying that uh, uh, i personally started loving singapore butterflies just after looking at the butterfly uh, circle blog mm-hmm. and i also was fortunate enough to buy uh, you know butterflies of singapore from singapore and i, I asked q to right. you know, post me and uh, i got it a couple of years back too so uh, and yeah uh, thanks again for showing a wonderful